Me to go? Yes, sir. Luke chapter 15, probably three stories well known to all of you. Um, for those of you for whom English is a second language, I'd like to explain a word. When I was, um, you may not have come across it, when I was a young man, a young boy in school, I always wanted to be an etymologist not an entomologist who studies insects, but uh, an etymologist who uh, loves to explore the meanings of words. But that had to give way to my other dream, which was to play for Manchester United with Georgie Best and Bobby Charlton, but that dream never came true either. But um, I do love the, uh, the way in which words come to be together. I was delighted a few years ago to read in the new Oxford English Dictionary that the word surly, which we regard as a bit of an insult, oh, he's surly, uh, originally was a compliment. He's sir-like, he's aristocratic in his bearing. Well, it's a bit like that with the word lost. There's a, it's chapter 15, is full of the word lost. This my son was lost, is found again. Lost coin, lost sheep, lost son. Uh, the word lost comes originally from an old English word, Lausian, uh, which meant to perish. Eventually, it came to be used as stuff that you've misplaced. But originally, it meant to perish. We still use it a little bit like that if we refer to somebody as being lost at sea. We don't mean that they, they've gone somewhere in a boat and we can't find them. It means that they've perished. They, they've been lost at sea. And uh, if, I, if you met me in the town centre, whenever we're free to go back to our town centres, if you met me in the town centre and you said to me, how are you? And I replied, well, I've lost my wife. You would need to try and understand whether I was referring to the fact that she, I've misplaced her in Marks and Spencers, or whether she's passed away, because the word can be used in both connections. And it's a little bit like that. In Luke chapter 15, it's the Greek word is apolumi. Sometimes it means to be lost or misplaced. And, uh, but in, in verse um, 17, it's used of perishing. Verse 17, do you see that? How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And he, here I am, perishing, starving to death. It's the same word that is translated lost. So I want to think about that this morning. This my son was dead, is alive, was lost and is found. Now it's obvious from these stories that um, the condition of being lost is pretty serious. It's not a matter of inconvenience, but of tragedy. And in these three parables, to be lost is to have your existence threatened. The sheep, the little sheep that's got lost is in danger of being ripped apart by wolves. The coin is in danger of being lost permanently in the dust. And uh, the, the son is in danger of being separated from his family for, for a long time, if not permanently. So it's a, we're not dealing with a, a simple thing. We're dealing with a, a serious thing here. Remember my mother, when she lived in Blackpool, she once lost her engagement ring. It was very, very traumatic. We looked everywhere. We couldn't find it. And then she remembered that she had been burying tea bags uh, next to her rose bushes. Apparently, tea, tea bags can fertilize rose bushes. So she went out to the garden. She began to dig around the, the roots of the rose bush. And there in that lovely black soil in, in Blackpool, <laughs> she found her engagement ring and how relieved she was. Now, these three, these three parables show different kinds of lostness. The sheep gets lost because it ignorantly just follows its own nature. I don't suppose that it had a planning meeting and sat down with a handsome ram and decided to run away and go and live in Ramsgate in Kent or Ramsbottom in Lancashire. No, th this sheep got lost simply because it did what sheep do. It wandered along chewing one blade of grass after another until it was away from safety. 
so the, the sheep was lost because it just followed its own nature. The coin was lost because of powerful forces that overwhelmed it. It came, came loose from the, uh, the, the, the woman's necklace or from her, uh, her bangle, from her uh, wrist bangle, and it fell into the dust. It probably a dirt floor in the house. It fell into the dust because it was overwhelmed by the power of gravity. And it uh, fell to the ground and rolled away and was, was hidden from sight. So the sheep was lost because it followed its own nature. The coin was lost because it was overwhelmed by gravity. And the two sons, both sons were lost actually, but both of them were lost because of choices that they made. One was lost to self-indulgence. The other was lost to self-righteousness. They both made decisions that revealed just what condition their hearts were in. They weren't uh, just ignorantly following nature. They weren't just helpless victims of the circumstances around them. They were choosing beings who took themselves, both of them took themselves into a state of rebellion against their father. That's what it means to be lost. Now these three, these three pictures of lostness, um, of how things get lost is pretty typical of human experience. The Bible shows us that we are lost because like the sheep, we have a fallen nature and we just follow our own hearts and the inclinations of our own hearts. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter four, people are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. So we, we live ignorantly. We straying away from God, just like a sheep does straying away from the flock. We're just following the inclinations and desires of our own hearts, our nature. And scripture also shows us that we're at the mercy of the powerful forces around us. There's a, a moral and spiritual gravity in, this, in the culture around us that is wanting to pull us away from God. Um, the behavior and the attitudes of the people around us can have a powerful influence upon us. And there's, it's, it's as if there's a magnet in our hearts and there's a magnet in the world and they're, attract, they're attracted to one another. And then of course, there are the bad choices we make. It's not just a case of our natural ignorance or the pressures of the culture around us we make choices like the two sons in this chapter we're not victims we're not just victims of our makeup and we're not just victims of our own bringing we're in charge of our own consciences and our own decisions and when God brings us to judgment as he surely will then we will have to give an account of the things that we did in the body whether good or bad. So when you, when you put these three parables together, they present a picture of what the Bible means by lostness. We're spiritually ignorant and stupid and just do what's in our hearts to do. We're dragged down by the world around us and we choose to follow the lusts and appetites of our hearts. So as far as God is concerned, we are lost because of two things. We're lost because of our bad record, the things we've done and thought and said, and because of our bad hearts, because of the nature in us that's instinctively rebellion, rebellious. So that's um, just a, a brief overview of, of what it means to be lost. Sheep, coin, sons. And how, how is lostness dealt with in, in these three parables? What is it that, that makes a huge difference? Well, there are two things I want to share with you this morning. The first one is the Lord must come looking for us. That's the lesson of the first two parables. The sheep and the coin are going to stay lost unless someone takes the initiative to come where they are and find them, seek and find. 
Um, the picture is of a shepherd scouring the countryside, looking for signs of that little furry beast and listening for faint bleatings in the distance. He's straining his eyes and he's straining his ears uh, in order to find this little thing that's gone astray and to, um, to, to pick it up and to put it on his shoulder and carry it back to safety. The other is, is of a housewife. She lives probably in a darkened house with a dirt floor with very, very little in the way of windows. She lights a lamp. She does that. She gets a broom. She sweeps in every corner until she sees that little gleam under the table in the corner where the coin has bounced out of sight and got hidden in the dust of the floor. Now, in, in, both, in both pictures, the implication is that the search is full on and determined. It's wholehearted, nothing's held back. Uh, the, the physical and mental powers of the shepherd, the physical and mental powers of this woman, they're fully deployed in order to find the lost thing. And you can discern something of the intensity of the search by the passion which is displayed when the lost thing's found. In both cases, they call in friends and neighbors, come and celebrate because the thing I lost has been found. Rejoice with me because I found my sheep or I found my coin. So here are two parables where the lost things can't find themselves. The initiative is completely in, in the hands of the seeker, the one who goes looking and we're meant to understand that this is this is Jesus. He came to seek and the, to save that which was lost. That was his initiative. It wasn't an accident. It was a purpose. He came into this world on purpose to passionately seek and save what was lost. There's so much emphasis in the human race on our independence we, we are told constantly that as human beings, we are perfectly capable of discovering the truth for ourselves. We can go searching in different religions and we can, we can eventually use our intelligence and our initiative to, to, to come to, to a place of truth. Um, uh, we don't need anybody to come looking for us. We can go looking for the gods and make our own judgments. Well, that's not the Bible's view. Scriptures are pretty clear. We are darkened in our understanding. We're darkened in our understanding. We are hard in our hearts. We're incapable of making sense of the world because we're standing in the wrong place with inadequate resources. We're like a, a deaf man trying to understand Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. We're like a blind man trying to explain a rainbow. We can't do it. We're without we're without hope, the Bible says. We're without God and without hope in the world. We are utterly and completely lost. And we will remain lost. And we would have remained lost were it not for the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, took the initiative to come into this world in order to rescue us. Somebody needs to come looking for us. And that's what the Son of God did. By taking the human body, by living a perfect life, by dying a death that was, should have been ours, dying that death for our sins, rising from death to give us new life. And then he went back to heaven and he sent the Holy Spirit into the world to fill the church and to send the church sweeping in every corner of this world until we are found. If you just think back to your own life and experience this morning and think of the people that God sent into your life in order to reach you and find you and bring you to himself, a, a mother and a father, a friend, a work colleague, circumstances, books you read. There's all sorts of things that God used to bring you to himself. So uh, the, this search is like a shepherd who takes the initiative to come and find us. And I think it's like the shepherd's wife who sweeps in every corner of the house until she finds that lost coin. So in order for us to no longer be lost, first of all, the Lord must come looking for us. The second thing is 
we must return to the Lord. There's a thing that he does. He comes looking, he takes initiative, but there's something that we have to do. And this is one of those places in the Bible where it's very difficult to square the logic of God's mind. We can't know the truth unless the Lord takes the initiative to come and to seek and save us. But we will never know the joy of salvation unless we take the initiative and go and take hold of the Lord and his promise of salvation. It was up to, it's up, it was up to him to turn around and go back to the offended father and ask for mercy. It was up to this lost son to come to his senses and decide what to do and make his way home and to go to the father it was up to him and he came home thinking he could somehow put things right with with a plan of debt reduction what he found when he got home having taken this initiative he found something unthinkable and and too amazing he found when he got home not a scheme of self-help but a loving embrace and a wholehearted welcome back into the family. He wasn't asked to return the money that he'd so foolishly spent. He wasn't asked to return and make restitution. He came expecting a frosty reception. He came expecting a lifetime of toil and restitution to make up for the damage he'd caused. But he found himself falling into the arms of a loving father, the arms of love. He found himself forgiven, accepted, rejoiced over. And then there was this fantastic celebration in honor of his return. The guest of honor, he was the guest of honor, dressed in the robes of um, honored celebrity, fated, fested with music and the, the, fat, the fattened calf being slain. But every note of music, every bite of steak, Every glass of wine, every tearful kiss, every bit of jewellery and clothing was all free. He came home expecting to have to work his way back into the affections of his father. And he found it was all free because he chose to come home to the father. Now that's the gospel. That's the gospel. The Lord Jesus Christ takes the initiative to enter into the world to come to where we were in our lostness and helpless condition. He does everything necessary to bring us to safety, even going to the cross and bearing our sins in his body on the tree so that we can sing all the love that drew salvation's plan, all the grace that brought it down to man, all the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. So that's the wonder of the gospel, that when we, when we come back, when we return, everything is free. Forgiveness is free. The love of God is free. Eternal life is free because of the love of the Father and the Son for his lost son. Well, un unfortunately, there's a tragedy in this story. Uh, and it's, it's this, that the greatest enemy of the gospel isn't sin. The greatest enemy of the gospel is not sin. It's not immorality. It's not evil. The greatest enemy of the gospel is religion. The scandalous son was wonderfully saved. The sanctimonious son found himself outside the family. Not because he was, he was any worse than anybody else, but because he was consumed with a sense of his own self-righteousness. He thought he deserved everything that the father had to give. He was offended by the free grace that his father showed to this sinful, scandalous son. Just like these Pharisees in the first part of Luke chapter 15, they hated it. When Jesus dined with sinners and tax collectors, they stood on their pedestals of self-righteousness, looking down upon the Son of God, thinking that they'd earned salvation because of their good works, because of their religiosity. 
the greatest enemy of the gospel, my friends, is not sin, but religion, self-righteousness. There are millions of people in this world who think that they can earn their way into the affections of God by what they do, by the things, the religious things they perform, and they are completely wrong. Religion, self-righteousness, is the greatest enemy of the gospel. When Jesus speaks in these parables about uh, 99 persons who need no repentance, he's not actually saying that 99 out of 100 people don't need to repent of their sin. He's talking about those people who don't think they have any need of repentance because they are perfectly good enough as they are. It may be that one or two Two of you or some of you are listening this morning and you think that there's a place in heaven for you because you're good enough, because you're religious enough, because you're kind enough, decent enough. You're not as bad as Adolf Hitler, you're not as bad as Joseph Stalin. You're certainly a lot better than a lot of the people you could name. If that's your thinking, you're in big trouble because self-righteousness is the greatest enemy of the gospel. You might think that immoral people, prostitutes and thing, people like that, they need religion, they need salvation, but not you. You're perfectly all right as you are. Jesus says, if that's your position, if that's your attitude, you're in the same position as this son who was locked out of the feast. He didn't go in, he wasn't saved because he was so self-righteous. These people are shut out of the Father's house unless they see their need for repentance over their proud self-righteousness. There are people in congregations up and down the United Kingdom this morning. Some need to repent of their immorality and some need to repent of their religion, their decency. Until you come to that place where you can say with the old hymn, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross, I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, wash me, Saviour, or I die. I think that's uh, some of the things we learn from these three amazing parables. Lostness is like a sheep following its own nature. It's like a coin overwhelmed by the the gravitational pull around it, it's like, a, like sons making their foolish choices. It's also about God taking the initiative in the person of Christ to seek and to save what was lost. And it's about you coming to Jesus, falling into the arms of a loving father and receiving eternal life for free. What a, an amazing gospel uh, to Lloyd.